Hi everyone. My background is in mechanical engineering, computer science, and neuroscience. And what I always wanted to do when I grow up was to make Terminators and destroy the world. So <coughs> you're probably wondering why I got invited to speak here. I'm not sure myself. But <coughs> before I um, go ahead with the talk itself, I'd just like to give credit to a large list of people. Imagine this as something a bit like the cast of the Big Bang Theory. Um, these are all people in the lab. We don't dress as well as you guys do. Um, in particular, I'd like to pay tribute to my doctoral advisors, Paul Vichu and Rodney Douglas. Um, this work was done about 10 years ago, but I think it's much more relevant now than it was at the time we were doing it. So what's this talk about? It's about space. And when I'm talking about space, I mean space in a human context. So there's a human. Um, when we arrived on this world, we, were, we found ourselves in a sort of a space, a biosphere, and it contained lots of active things, like you know, trees, they grow, you could do stuff, cut them down, burn them, you know, lots of cool stuff. You could grow certain types of trees and eat them. There was also this stuff called weather, right? You get wet, you get hot, it was a bit annoying, but it also had some good things about it. And there were other living things like us, like you know, cute fluffy bunnies, they're good, you can eat them. And also nasty things like spiders, they're bad, although some of them can also be eaten, but that's not the point. <coughs> so anyway, the world's very interactive, right? And it can get a bit too much, right? All this stuff coming at you, oh God, you know, so much interaction, you know, where do I find time to relax, chill out? And so what we did was we built static spaces for ourselves, you know, such as this room, right? And the key thing about static spaces is that nothing really changes in here, right? If you come back in 10 hours, the weather hasn't changed in here. Everything's dead in here, right? Except for ourselves and whatever parasites you brought in with you. So <clears throat> this is interesting, right? Even these plants here, I checked, they, they were alive until they were cut out and stuck in the little bits of water. I think these are plastic, I'm not sure. And these bits of wood are definitely dead. So, you know, why, if the world is so wonderful, that nature is so great, why did we create this static space for ourselves? And the reason, of course, is so that we could survive. You know, so that we weren't so busy interacting with the environment, trying not to get killed and eaten, we could have time for hobbies to do other things. Okay, and, you know, so this, we became pretty good at it until about 1900, right? We had a lot of time, we... Our caves became houses, they became really good houses. And over time, we seemed to sort of miss what was going on out there. And so what we did was we went from the cave and we thought, well, I actually like bits of that weather, so I put a window in there. You know, let bits of the weather in. If I don't like it, I close it. Right? So I, I installed my first system regulation mechanism. And this was the first step towards our spaces becoming like organisms. If you imagine the walls like a sort of a membrane, you started poking holes in the membrane, you put windows in, maybe some skylights, water feature perhaps. You installed useful things like electricity, plumbing. You know, plumbing is the world's largest network, right? Very useful one. And all of these things started to connect our spaces to the outside world so that the space itself could be seen as a type of organism. And this was recognized in the early 20th century by a Swiss architect who needs no introduction here. And he said, I'll just read it out, a house is a machine for living in. Around the same time, <clears throat> but he's quoted sometime later, is a Harvard psychologist called Skinner. And what he said was that the real problem is not whether machines can think, but whether people do. And assuming that you accept both of these statements, if you take the statement, a house is a machine, together with machines think, then something about houses, so these buildings we are in, they think. And that's strange. So, you know, how, how might you build something like that? And actually, Skinner did something like that in his doctoral work, not long after the Swiss architect I mentioned. He built what's called a Skinner box. This is an operant conditioning box. So you have a rat. The rat is exposed to certain stimuli that you design, so this could be like a speaker playing a certain sound or a flashing pattern of lights. The rat had to perform a certain action. In this case, it was pressing a lever. And if it did it at the right time, this is the right response to the right stimulus, it received a food reward. And if it didn't do it, 
it received a punishment. And the punishment was the form of an electric shock through the grating in the floor. All right, imagine if you had that, you'd learn some things fairly quickly. So <clears throat> Skinner did a lot of work in working out the re reward schedules. So when to d provide the reward and the punishment so that the rat could learn as quickly as possible. Interestingly, this is just a side point, this is what he built for his baby, his first child. <laughs> right. It was an air crib. Um, <clears throat> it actually had a lot of good features. For example, it was climate controlled, so the kid did not need clothes. Right? You didn't have to worry about keeping the child warm or, because it was always nicely climate controlled in there. My favourite feature was that you never had to change the sheets because there was this roll of paper here and if you needed to change the sheets, you just rolled it out, fresh, freshly made sheets. So he made this for his wife. I guess his wife was happy. Unfortunately, a lot of people decided to associate this with this and he'd, he'd become quite famous for this. And so this nearly never really caught on. Okay, but anyway, getting back to the original story. Sometime after all this was done, a certain other type of <coughs> Skinner box became popular. And here's an example of one. Okay, it's a disco, as you can see. It has stimuli. You get certain patterns of noises which are played in this disco. It has stimuli in the form of lights, either in the floor or in the ceiling. And if you perform certain actions, if you time these actions correctly, I guarantee that you will get rewarded <laughs> with the attentions of potential mates. So this is pretty good, right? Evolutionary, quite important. <clears throat> However, if you don't do it right, I also guarantee that you'll be punished. You'll have to go and stand at the bar with all the other losers, right? <laughs> Trust me, I've done plenty of that. So, you know, being researchers, what we did was, what well, you know, we have to investigate this, let's build one. So we built a disco, but this disco was a bit unusual. It was exhibited in Neuchâtel, not, long, not far from here, about 10 years ago. We had about half a million people pass through our disco, which made us feel cool. Um, what we did was we connected the disco to a computer and we made everything interactive. So the floor here, 360 floor tiles, they could flash on and off, we could control them all. We could also sense when people were standing on a particular floor tile. We had lights that could point at different people, also cameras, a 360 degree display and microphones. So if someone clapped, we could tell where that person was in the space who clapped. Now, <clears throat> the reason we called it Ada was that we envisioned it, envisioned it as a kind of organism. And this organism would go through a kind of life cycle. I'm just talking through it. So what happened is the space would perform actions like this, okay? It would sense you through its uh, overhead cameras. It would track you, so it would try to give you a number and work out who you were and keep track of you so that it could interact with you. And these interactions were in the form of these so-called gazer cameras. If, if you were tracked for long enough, it would point the gazer at you, zoom in on you, and then show your image up on the screen here. Okay, so the space is Big Brother's really watching you and it's showing you that it's watching you. And it's, strangely enough, people like being watched in certain contexts, right? So I think this says something about the voyeur in all of us. This was an important part of the work we were doing in trying to solve the problem of how a space can allocate resources, right? You have a lot of people in this space. You have a certain number of resources, such as lights, cameras, and so on. How do you decide who's the most important? most important, most interesting person to talk to. So what we did was you follow the red line, sorry, the, the blue line, you track the person for a while. After you're confident you've tracked the person for a, a while, you can test their compliance. And in this case, it was a flashing white tile. So the space tries to communicate with you, it shows a flashing white tile. If I see it and I follow it, that means that I understood something about the space's communication, so I became interesting to the space. And so if I did this for long enough, then I was rewarded. So then all of the lights would point at me, my picture would show, go up on the screen. The space was allocating its limited resources to me because I had engaged in this dialogue with the space and therefore become more interesting to it. So all this fed into what we called the homeostatic happiness mechanism of the space. So the space's goal in life was to interact with people in this way and become happier. There were also other factors in the 
happiness function of the space, such as maintaining a certain number of people in the space, not too many so that it didn't become overloaded and not too few so that it didn't become lonely. <coughs> Another experiment we did with the space was to see how the space could learn. You know, it's, it's not a given that if someone shows me a flashing white tile next to me that I'm going to follow it. So what we did was we reversed the Skinner box. Now, instead of the space teaching the people, we had the people teach the space. So the space would show a stimulus, a flashing tile, for example. It might have been a pattern of tiles, for example, a shooting bullet. And if a person followed the stimulus, this was interpreted as a reward. Okay? So the space says, oh, this person did it, but I should try to do that again. And if they didn't do it, it's a punishment. And by doing this, what we were able to do was to actually influence the behavior of people in the space. And, and this is how we measured it. What you see on the left here is a diagram of where people normally spent time in the space. So they would come in here. The, the brighter areas are where they normally spent their time. And the darker areas are where they didn't spend their time. We noticed that people tended to, tended to not hang around the entrance. And they also tended to stay away from this corner. So after having the space learn about which of these cues people were most likely to respond to, it turned out to be a little sort of shooting bullet of tiles. We then deployed it, and we found we were able to influence the behavior of people without them noticing it. <clears throat> and of course, this has applications, you can imagine, in things like you know, crowd safety, getting people towards the shop you want them to go to, and so on. So where's all this leading? I mean, is, is the future going to become like one giant casino? You know, everywhere you go, you're being rewarded and punished. And yeah, maybe it will be, you know. It's already happening. Um, some of you probably subscribe to Groupon, so you, you get your local deal of the day and you go rushing off to your local shop to get a cheaper haircut or something like that, right? This little stimulus is influencing your behavior so that you get rewarded, and also the person offering the free haircut gets, gets rewarded. And this can happen over quite large areas. You know, everyone knows the sizes of typical casinos in Atlantic City and Las Vegas. Another area where a lot of you will work, or may work, is in areas which are either connected to or directly involved with shopping malls. Okay. Now, shopping malls are so large these days that they can be seen as organisms, right? They are things that you have created, collectively I mean, which have goals. Their goals are to bring people in, to get people to leave their money behind, and then hopefully not leave. Right? Ideally, you'd build apartments that they'd stay there and they'd make and spend all their money, and they'd live within your own shopping mall ecosystem. And the, apart from the obvious things which we've seen in Minority Report, where if you're walking around you get personalized advertising, you know, this may happen. I think more subtle things will happen. These shopping malls have goals apart from getting you to spend money. They have goals, for example, to minimize their energy consumption, right? Apart from the fact that that's good for the environment, it's also good for the shopping mall because it saves money. We did some experiments in our office where, for example, we had some learning algorithms trying to work out when to raise and lower the blinds. Now, in an energy optimal sense, if you wanted to use as little energy as possible, you would keep the blinds down all the time. Right? Perfect. Unfortunately, the people in the office don't like it. They like to look outside. And so they're getting constantly annoyed by the software in the building, bringing down the blinds. You press a button, you open it again. And after a while, if you punish the building enough, it will leave the blinds up as long as it knows that you're in the room and it knows that you're in the room because the, sensor, the infrared sensor, such as what you have in the bathroom, knows that there's someone in the room and they've pressed this button to punish me, so therefore I should probably leave the blinds up when that person's in the room. So this is a very sort of simple example of the type of homeostatic processes which all influence each other, uh, which create, go together to create these organisms where it's not completely obvious what's going to happen at the time that you build it. Right? And th these are things that you guys are building, creating. I mean, it's not just the technology, it's the systems. The way that, you know, the person delivers stuff to the shops, <clears throat> the way you organize the lighting. The lighting, of course, you know, influences the moods of the people. 
in, in the mall, right? This influences behavior. And so because we're, we're moving more and more from a world which is surrounded by what originally came with the world, you know, all these trees and rocks and things, to a world where everything we see and touch and do is created by us. When I came from Zurich this morning, you know, <coughs> I left my apartment, which was full of dead things or things made by me or a few plants were still alive. You know, I got to this train station, I passed maybe 10 trees on the way to the station. Everything else was dead. Right? It's not, and it didn't, not saying it didn't look nice, I'm saying that it was not organic, apart from the people and maybe their pets. Between Zurich and Lausanne, there was all these trees and your know, nature, farms and so on, it's very nice. And then you come in here and everything's dead again, right? So obviously we prefer dead stuff. And we sort of try to give it some sort of spark of life by building all of these fancy interactive gadgets into it, which behave the way we like it to. They're becoming so complex that they're taking on a life of their own. And so I'd like to leave you with this sort of message that <clears throat> it's not about sort of everyone getting back to nature and living in wooden huts. That's not going to happen. We're going to be living in more of these types of spaces. So it's up to you to design these spaces in a way which is responsible and which you enjoy living with and also everybody else enjoys living with. Thanks. Thank you, Clayton.